Thank you. Good morning. Get these going. All right, so we're going to spend the next 15, 20 minutes talking about heart failure and what that means, what symptoms, treatments, and trajectories are in ARVC specifically. So we'll define heart failure and also the word cardiomyopathy, understand this in the context of ARVC, describe signs and symptoms, and then review our treatment strategies. So arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. So that's the key word, cardiomyopathy. What does that mean? So it's literally defined as weakening of the heart muscle. And cardiomyopathy can be due to a myriad uh, of causes. ARVC is just one of them. So most commonly, patients who have coronary artery disease or have had heart attacks can develop a cardiomyopathy. Genetic conditions, as we're talking about today, infiltrative diseases, Infections can cause things like myocarditis or inflammation of the heart wall, um, other toxins, and actually arrhythmias can lead to cardiomyopathy. Yeah. Okay. All right. This way. This way? Yes. All right. Thank you. Um, so all of these can lead to also ultimately congestive heart failure. And we'll talk about heart failure. Um, so this is a clinical syndrome with current or prior symptoms and signs caused by structural or functional cardiac abnormality, and that's also corroborated or confirmed by objective evidence of congestion. So, you know, I, I will pause and just say that the word heart failure, some of you have heard me say this, it's, um, it's, it's an unfortunate word that we use. None of you are sitting here failing at anything. You are succeeding with ARVC, right? Um, but it, you know, we really moved towards using the word cardiomyopathy or describing impaired heart function. But for the purposes of this, we will talk uh, in the terms of heart failure. So heart failure is actually prevalent in the general population. So six million Americans over the age of 20, this is projected to reach eight million by 2030, will have heart failure. The lifetime risk is actually 20 to 45 percent in Americans that are older. Um, and there are many new cases of heart failure a year. And that's, unfortunately, it is associated with um, impaired survival in the long term. Heart failure uh, is also a significant, um, uh, has a significant impact on our health system. And so there's a lot of support and interest in supporting patients and improving care for patients with heart failure more globally because of this. So uh, there will be over a million hospitalizations for heart failure a year, and notably a quarter of these patients are actually readmitted to the hospital within 30 days. Many outpatient visits, and actually the cost is projected, to, healthcare cost is projected to reach 70 billion by the year 2030 for heart failure alone. So let's pivot to ARVC, which we're here to talk about today. So as Dr. Calkins mentioned, with our improved recognition of, of the condition and genetic testing and counseling with defibrillator therapy, the good news is patients with ARVC are living longer. And so with that comes the risk of uh, progressing and developing other manifestations of the condition. And so, um, this slide just demonstrates kind of the, the phenotypic progression over time, and you can see how that heart structure changes over time uh, with that as well. And that's where we see more of the heart failure picture come in, where the heart remodels. It may become dilated to kind of actually compensate for the fact that it's had impaired function and forward flow over time. Now, heart failure that I've described to you in terms of kind of the global burden, um, in ARVC it's unique. You all are used to being unique. Um, ARVC commonly affects the right ventricle, so it's a much more rare form of cardiomyopathy. Uh, but it can affect the left as well, as we know now. Arrhythmias are common. And because of some of the differences, the medications we traditionally use for heart failure may not have the same benefits or um, effects in ARVC. I mentioned briefly that the physiology of heart failure and ARVC can, can be different. So um, this is, let's see, you can see my pointer there. So this is what a normal heart looks like. You can see the left ventricle is the major muscle of the heart. Um, you're, we're cutting through right now, if the heart's sitting here, we're cutting through like donut slices. 
And the right ventricle is a, is a much thinner structure, this crescent-shaped structure. And what happens in right ventricular cardiomyopathy is that the right ventricle might get more dilated, and actually it's usually smaller than the left ventricle, and it may become bigger than the left ventricle. And so the left ventricle may be operating normally, but when it has that increased pressure from the right, um, you can see the structural changes that can then impair forward uh, blood flow. So this is a busy slide. Um, it's a recent review of right ventricular failure. Um, I present mostly to just show you there are a lot of different reasons for right ventricular cardiomyopathy, people with heart attacks, inflammation, after surgery, um, and other causes can, um, can lead to right ventricular failure. ARVC is, is listed despite being rare. We've made it to the list um, of, of uh, reasons for right ventricular failure. Um, and so this just demonstrates kind of the pathophysiology we'll talk a little bit more about as we go through. So we, um, we looked at our cohort through the ARVC registry here at Hopkins to identify how common is heart failure in our ARVC patients and how do they manifest. And so um, as, as Dr. Hawkins alluded to, actually we found amongst 289 patients that close to half of them met clinical criteria for heart failure. So structural changes in the heart um, and then symptoms of congestion or heart failure. About a fifth of the patients had biventricular involvement, so that means both ventricles are involved. The left-sided ejection fraction in those patients was 38%, so normal is 55%, so I always tell patients we're not trying to score 100% on our echo test. 55% is normal, so if you are 50, 55, that is great with ARVC, and sometimes we just see that when the right ventricle is kind of bigger um, for um, the left ventricular ejection fraction. Development of these symptoms um, on uh, median age was 41, and 10 years after presentation, about a third of patients had developed some um, manifestations of heart failure. We found that predictors included female sex, having RV dysfunction or dilatation, that, that makes sense, the more dilated your right ventricle is, the more symptoms you may have. Hypertension, so hypertension is just a risk factor at baseline for heart failure in the general population. Not a lot of our ARVC patients have hypertension, but if you do, it does increase that risk. And then one of the minor criteria we look on um, EKG for. These were the symptoms that patients described. So um, most commonly it was shortness of breath or dyspnea, fatigue, and we know that's multifactorial. And so in this, the limitation of the study was we couldn't kind of parse out, is it all that beta blocker that we're on or is it truly uh, related to the heart failure um, phenotype that we have fatigue, volume overload, and left-sided symptoms were actually rare, which makes sense since this is mostly a right-sided process. So um, along those lines, what might patients with heart failure um, experience? So we talked about it, fatigue. This might come across as exercise intolerance, not that you're supposed to be exercising, but just day-to-day -day activities, right? Can I get through the grocery store, and six months later, can I get through half the grocery store now? Can I pick up my toddler, and now um, I can't kind of run, run after them as much? Leg swelling, um, so that's also known as edema. You may have abdominal bloating, swelling, or tightness, because, again, the heart is a pump. If the right side of the heart can't pump blood forward, it backs up in the rest of our body. So you might notice weight gain, you might notice nausea, decreased appetite, just because the, the belly is full of some extra fluid. Um, and then shortness of breath is more typically a left-sided symptom. There are a couple of things um, that can be experienced in that setting. Orthopnea is a medical term for shortness of breath when you're lying flat. So now if you're having to prop yourself up on pillows to sleep at night. Paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea means having paroxysms at night of shortness of breath. So that wakes you up from, from sleep. So if any of you have met me in clinic, we're probably going through kind of this checklist of, of symptoms. And what your doctor might see. So they may, um, we love looking at the neck veins. Um, I promise we are not vampires. We are just looking at your jugular venous pressure, which directly connects to the right side of the heart to see if the fluid levels are elevated. Um, there are other signs of enlarged uh, uh, an enlarged right heart on, um, that we can hear on stethoscope or exam. Might, again, edema is leg swelling, an enlarged liver. Fluid in the belly is called ascites or a murmur of tricuspid regurgitation. 
In terms of blood work, um, we'll sometimes check the pro-BNP or natriuretic peptide. This is elevated in settings of stress or stretch in the heart chambers. Uh, it can help in patients who have shortness of breath differentiate causes of shortness of breath, so heart failure versus not. Um, I will just give the caveat that this is elevated in any sort of stress on the heart. So if you've had ventricular arrhythmia or you have hypertension or valve disease, we may see that it's elevated. And then the other thing that we monitor closely is your kidney function and your liver function because both of those can go off if you are more congested because the heart's not pumping blood forward or if there's just not enough blood getting to the heart or kidneys. Everyone here is familiar with getting echocardiograms. That's the ultrasound of the heart. That gives us information about the size and function of the heart. Um, I talked about the left-sided ejection fraction value. And then one more invasive test that we may do is a right heart catheterization. So again, we go after that vein in the neck because it, it connects directly to the heart. Um, we're able to just put in a large bore IV, and then through that we float a pulmonary artery catheter through the chambers of the heart, and that gives us a sense of what the pressures are in the heart. So are the fluid levels elevated? And then also, how well is the heart pumping blood forward? So you measure the cardiac output um, during this test as well. Another test that we can do to assess um, patients from a heart failure standpoint is something called cardiopulmonary exercise stress testing. It's the one time Dr. Hawkins will let you exercise. So we get you either on a treadmill or a bike um, with a mouthpiece uh, that's measuring your respirations, oxygen, carbon dioxide levels, and it's helpful in determining is your limitation because of fatigue and deconditioning, because of your lungs, or because there's actually a cardiac limitation. So we can give you an objective measurement, um, and this is used in... Um, in heart failure patients in general to kind of think about, do I need to start thinking about more advanced therapies for heart failure? So we'll transition to medications. So kind of two groups of medications. One is to symptomatically treat congestion or volume overload. Diuretics are the mainstay. There are a couple of different ones. Basically, that means, you know, what comes in has to go out. If the heart's inefficient and can't get blood to the kidneys to naturally kind of urinate that out, we have to give it a boost with diuretics. And then for those who have congestion, fluid overload, it's important to stick to flu uh, fluid and sodium restrictions because again, what comes in has to get out, um, and so that can minimize our need to, to use diuretics instead. And then in terms of the cardiomyopathy itself, um, we have great evidence for several medications in heart failure and cardiomyopathy. Most of those studies have been done in the left-sided cardiomyopathies. And so we kind of extrapolate that information over uh, to ARVC and other cardiomyopathies. Uh, but these improve some of the neurohormonal axis that gets triggered in heart failure, um, can help with uh, remodeling of the heart muscle itself. Uh, but your, your doctor will kind of work with you and see what you might be eligible to be on um, based on the physiology of your heart. Um, this is just a, a one-page ed education sheet that we give our patients who end up being hospitalized with heart failure. Um, some of the key things are, you know, those fluid and sodium restrictions. If you are having issues with congestion, this does not apply to everyone with ARVC necessarily. Uh, one thing that you can do, wake up in the morning, go to the bathroom that first time, weigh yourself every morning. Uh, and we don't usually gain fat or muscle overnight. Um, that takes more work to do. But fluid, you can have quick shifts in, in, and so you can kind of keep an eye on, on your fluid status that way. All right, and last we'll talk about trajectory. So take home here is most patients will remain stable, though we are recognizing increasing symptoms of heart failure in our patients, and it's important to identify any changes early. And so this is a figure from a, a paper from some of my colleagues that um, is focused on when do you think about more advanced therapies for patients with heart failure in general, um, the key one here being transplant that we'll, we'll discuss, and there's kind of this golden window for referral. So oftentimes when we're meeting in clinic, it's that early piece that we're just, we just want to keep an eye on things um, as we uh, progress or don't progress. Um, once patients do reach a point where the arrhythmias are under control, but 
the heart is just not getting enough blood flow to the rest of the body, then um, we can lean on a couple of different interventions. So one is device therapies. These are um, less readily available for the right ventricle in the sense that you need to be in the hospital for them. So they're usually temporary to get you through some acute phase that you might need. Sometimes even to you know, get through a, a VT ablation, you might need to support your heart with some of these devices uh, temporarily. Um, or to more definitive treatment like heart transplantation. The left ventricular cyst device is something that if you are in kind of um, the heart failure world reading up in terms of therapies, I just want a quick word on this. We use it less in ARVC, but if you have primarily left-sided disease, this is a durable heart pump that you can go home with um, in, in the right context. And patients can often lead quite normal lives with these heart pumps short of being able to do things like go swimming in the ocean. But, um, but basically what you're seeing here is um, it's a, it's a battery-operated pump that uh, most of the things that you're seeing here are internalized, and there's a modular cable in the battery externally. So April is actually National Donate Life Month, um, and so we'll talk a little bit about heart transplantation in the last two minutes here. So when do we think about heart transplantation? Um, so, so there's two big categories. One is intractable arrhythmias, and then the other is progressive heart failure symptoms. Um, and with, uh, with that, we may see that we're needing additional medications like IV medications to help support the heart or some of those devices that I talked about. Our general approach is to start early if we are going down the evaluation process. It's a multidisciplinary evaluation, involves the ARVC team, the heart failure team, but you will meet everyone kind of head to toe, our surgeons, nutritionists, social workers, um, et cetera. And then we do do a lot of testing as part of that evaluation. And ultimately, if we talk through risk and benefit um, in terms of transplant, then you would be wait listed on the national uh, wait list for heart transplantation. I do want to emphasize heart transplantation is a rare thing. So these are all patients in the U.S. with heart failure. We do about 3,500 transplants across the country every year uh, for all patients. When it comes to ARVC, we looked at um, the National Registry up until 2019 here. You can see generally over time the number of transplants being done for ARVC increased. I think that is just a phenomenon of recognizing ARVC as a, as a condition, right? So 2010, the ARVC diagnostic criteria were revised, and then after that you can see kind of the uptick as well. When you think about the percent of total heart transplants in the country, though, it's less than 1% are done for ARVC. And patients with ARVC do just as well, if not better, than patients without ARVC undergoing heart transplant. And that's because you often you don't have all of the comorbidities that come along with chronic heart failure from other causes, like diabetes and chronic kidney disease and other things. It's usually in, in isolation. And so um, this is a, a diagram that kind of summarizes our approach here at Hopkins, put together by one of our um, heart failure and transplant fellows, Dr. Scheel. Um, in terms of how we evaluate a patient with ARVC for possible uh, for heart failure and then also possible heart transplant. And you know, after the diagnosis is made, um, as I mentioned, it can be an arrhythmia presentation or a heart failure presentation. We've gone through comprehensive assessment, medication initiation, um, testing with the right heart catheterization, cardiopulmonary exercise testing. And then if we're still progressing and not making progress, then we think about what is our strategy to get to that definitive treatment of heart transplantation, which is all the way at the bottom here. And that may be inotropic medications. So those are IV medications that help support the heart muscle uh, in the short term to get to transplant. That might be those temporary devices. So busy slide, but just kind of our algorithm to get there. So in conclusion, heart failure or Cardiomyopathy can be seen in ARVC. We monitor for signs and symptoms, such as shortness of breath, like swelling, abdominal bloating. Treatment includes symptomatic treatment, like fluid pills or diuretics, as well as heart failure-specific medications. And very rarely, patients may need heart transplantation. Thank you.